one of the first things I want to do now is get everybody on the same page and create a frame of reference for you within which finance functions operates. So I'm going to take a look at the markets, the business purpose of a firm, why does a firm exist, legal structures that are used in a business, and then to go through the different roles that folks have in finance. This will give you an idea of how a corporation runs, different roles, and what people in finance do. There's plenty of opportunities in the area of finance, and you'll see them as we develop through this course. The next thing is the markets. We always hear the financial markets. What does that mean? But we've got to come back and let's define what a market is to begin with. A market brings together those that have something to sell with those that want to sell something. It's, it's matchmaking. Okay, and price is determined between a willing buyer and a willing seller. Not necessarily what one thinks it's worth, but what somebody is willing to pay and somebody is willing to sell. That's that price. That's what a market is. Now, in we talk financial markets, there's private markets and there's public markets. If securities, okay, and that means stocks, bonds, and hybrids. If they're to be offered to the public, there's documentation and reports that must be submitted to the Securities and Exchange Commission. There's a whole series of rules and regulations as to offering of securities to the public. And this is intended primarily to protect investors from unscrupulous uh, people who are trying to pull the wool over or steal from people. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But securities need to be are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. The financial reports, the basic financial reports that are filed with the SEC are the annual 10K, which is all the financial information about the company, the quarterly 10Q. Those are the Q, the 10Ks and the 10Q, the basic financial statements. Now, some transactions are private between two parties. Okay, it's not a registered or an SEC regulated transaction. So if you and I want to enter into a transaction, that would be a private transaction. Important to distinguish between public versus private markets. Public has a lot more of information available. Companies that are not publicly held or don't have securities, whether that be equity or bonds, their information is not as readily available. We then look at markets as a whole. We have the U.S. public markets, which includes the New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, National Association of Security Dealers, CME Group. So these are the public markets. There's markets in every country around the world. And if you go to the Wall Street Journal during the day and you go to market data, you're going to find all of what's going on in the markets, not only in the U.S., but in Asia and in Europe. So that's what we refer to as, as public markets are these things. Let's now I want to look at primary offering of securities versus the secondary market. And this becomes an important distinction because in a primary offering, a company directly receives the cash. They have to file a form S1 and that's an initial public offering where the company itself is offering shares of itself to the public through a broker, through an investment banker, but the company gets the cash, okay? Oftentimes referred to as initial public offering. Then there's the secondary market. That's what the majority of everything on our, our American markets and foreign markets are, and those are transactions between investors. Issuers do not receive the cash. An important distinguish. Most all the transactions that are engaged in are, are secondary. But yet, it still is very important to a company what the stock price is. Because remember, the, the purpose, and we're going to get into this shortly, is that shareholders are looking for a return. Okay? And remember, they elect the board of directors who appoints managers. We also have share stake officers of the company whose compensation is based on the stock price. So that if the company's stock price does well, 
then the executives get more compensation. It's also important for stock price is to provide for future access to capital, where you may want to do another one of these primary issues uh, to get more funds into the company. Good stock price and a good record helps drive that. So that's the access to future capital. What is traded? Common stock. That's the ownership in the company. There's preferred stock, which is still an equity, but it has certain characteristics of debt. We'll talk about them. Then there are debt securities, where companies issue debt that's publicly held. Individual bonds. Many financial companies pool loans together, and they issue securitized transactions. More popular in auto loans, auto those that are in auto finance, they will pool their assets and sell them. Futures, options, exchange traded funds. We are going to look at all of these, but I want to give you a sense of when we're talking about the markets, this distinction, um, what is traded, what is a market, and the difference between a primary and a secondary offering. Now, when we start looking at a company, okay, there's different interests have different goals. So there's the shareholder, there's the customers, there's suppliers, employees, management, and then workers, and debt holders, and the government, and the public. That's everybody else. So each one of these have a different set of goals, objectives that they would like to see. Shareholder wants to see growth in investment. Okay? Sh customers want a quality product at a fair price. Suppliers want to source business being a business that pays them. Workers want more income and job stability. Debt holders want to be repaid. Government, it's a source of taxes. The public, safety. So if you're looking at a, a firm, a firm could focus on one of these and not look at all of them. They all are different, so the question becomes how do you balance them? Now, in the past, everything was about shareholders, okay? Trying to make as much money as possible, and you really didn't think too much about customers, suppliers, employees, debt holders, government, or the public. So today, what is being used is this concept of stakeholders, that you have many different stakeholders or people who are influenced by the action of the company. And as you can see, there's your business, there's your employees, government, community, owners, consumers. But then it builds out from there. On the consumer side, is it the average consumer? You have product liabilities, you have social activists. Uh, you have government agencies, federal, state, local, the general public, environmental groups, civic groups. You have minorities, women, older employees, unions, activists. And then you have private owners. They can be institutional investors, board members, private citizens. So you really have a lot of people who are impacted by the actions of the firm. And this is all done within a economic environment, within, a, within an economic environment, a political environment, a social environment, and technology environment. So a firm managed today is looking at how to balance all of these things. And I would suggest to you that the overall purpose of the firm is financial sustainability. That firm wants to align all of the interests so that it can be successful over the long time, which is recognizing that there are stakeholders and that each of the stakeholders has an, is, is impacted by what the firm does, but they also contribute to the firm's success. So you have to do the right thing for the customer. It has to be a fair price, a quality product, or the customer will leave. Okay. So this is about how do you align these interests and that's about financial sustainability, okay? And I think we're gonna keep hearing that as you go through some of the lectures
because it's where my brain is at now. Because any one of these we could take and make short term, uh, take short, short term actions within the firm to achieve them. But the firm wouldn't continue. In most firms, the basic purpose is to continue and to be financially sustainable, to benefit shareholders, customers, suppliers, workers, the community um, in a holistic way. So now with that said, that's the purpose, let's look at business structure. Uh, how are businesses structured? Well, you can be a sole proprietor. That means there's a single owner. An owner and manager are the same. It has a limited life, okay? It ends on the death of the individual. There's limited access to capital, unlimited personal liability. So if you own a business in your own name, say you own an, an apartment, a, a, a house, and you rent part of it out, you could be held liable if somebody is injured on the property. Okay, you can't always get money as fast as you would like. And, but the good side is the owner and managers are the same. There's no disagreement between owners and management. Very simplistic. You'll find massive numbers of business do many firms, especially your small firms, do business at a small as a small proprietor. Next one. We got business structure is partnerships, and that's two or more people who join skills in wealth together. It still has a limited life, still has limited access to capital because there's two people, has joint liability. This is a little bit of a scarier thing for partnerships is that if you are in a general partnership with somebody, you can be held accountable for their acts, whether they be physical acts or financial acts, if they incur debt in behalf of the partnership, you can be held liable. That's a partnership. Now, the more common form of business, once it gets beyond a very small and micro business, is generally a corporation. And that is a legally separate entity, okay? And it can be called a corporation, incorporated, limited liability corporation, terminology similar to that, but it's a, it's a legal being, okay? It has an unlimited life as compared to a sole proprietorship or a partnership where it ends upon death. There's oftentimes greater access to capital, meaning that you can raise money easier as a corporation. Um, owner has limited liability, okay? Now, this doesn't mean they don't have any liability because you're always responsible for payroll taxes, no matter your corporation, sole proprietor, or partnership. Um, but you're protected against other liability. It's a very efficient form of, of doing business. Now, when we look at a corporation, uh, we need to look at it within the context of this hierarchy of authority. It starts with the state charter. A state creates and authorizes a corporation to exist. There then are shareholders, those who own the company. Then there is the board of directors, and the board of directors hires management, and their role is to govern. Govern comes from the Greek word meaning to steer. So the board of directors makes sure there's a strategic plan in place monitors performance of management, reviews the financial affairs, makes sure there's a strategic plan, it hires the chief executive officer, and monitors his performance. So those are the responsibilities of the, the board. To summarize them, it's to govern, which means they are going to hire and evaluate the chief executive officer, they're going to review the financial affairs of the company, ensuring financial control is in place, and they're going to ensure there's a strategic plan. So they are going to guide the company. And then you have management. They're hired by the board of directors. The board of directors in turn is elected by the shareholders of the company. Management runs the day-to-day -day operations of the company and then there's the employees. So that's the hierarchy of authority. Now, we gotta go back and as we start to see this evolve, um, what you have 
is pre-corporate period and which is here and corporate period where you had owners and managers were the same okay so there was a close connection between ownership and the day-to-day -day running of the business which meant they were talking with workers they were talking with suppliers they were talking with customers so there was the presence of owners once we moved into the corporate period here what you see is we have the separation of shareholders who own the company in management who runs it and that's where this board of directors have come in what we've seen in recent years is as long as you have board of directors doing what they should be doing and you have them all focused on aligning the interests of the different stakeholders for financial sustainability everything is great but we've had times that the board of directors wasn't doing their job and the interest of shareholders and managers were very different okay they were focusing on benefiting primarily managers at the expense of shareholders which didn't happen in the pre-corporate period because there was that separation of there wasn't a separation between ownership and managers let's take a look at the simple corporate structure in a very simple corporate structure every company looks something like this there's always a president and chief executive officer somebody is in charge then there's always somebody who has customer responsibilities they take care of the customer that's the sales and customer care unit you then have operations in manufacturing who produce the product and in today's corporation the chief financial officer has really become one of the most powerful people in the firm based on a lot of the problems we have and the role of finance has changed dramatically and then we have those that are administrative support these are the people that are the human resources they're the facilities folks uh, they're the technology departments so if we look at if even if you're a small if you work in a restaurant you have sales customer care we'll call them in the restaurant business we call them front of house those are your servers uh, those are your hosts and hostesses those that interact with the customer the back room the back of the house are cooks okay uh, dishwashers those people who prepare the food and there's always somebody in charge of every organization so every organization that we're going to look at has an organization like that that's going to be one of our assignments in application project one is to define out what is the organizational structure based on looking at the form 10k so that gives us a, a, a really overview there the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the role of financial management in the firm let's now take a look at the role of financial management financial management has really evolved over time originally it was simply bookkeeping keeping track of what was going on with the business your basic accounting functionality and it evolved into reporting results and now it's moved into leadership and full integration into the management process of the firm a lot of it caused by problems by not having strong financial controls and a strong financial process in place it's now a broad integrated role that contributes to the financial sustainability of the firm finance has created a framework for decision making and providing for information for decision makers the finance people need to know how all the pieces work how do they fit together ensuring compliance with rules and regulations has also grown immensely in fact there's more availability of jobs in the area of compliance than any other field let's take a look at what a typical finance function looks like so what you're going to have is you have the chief financial officer here there's generally four people or so that report to him let's start with the controller uh, and the controller is responsible for general accounting reporting tax management accounting 
is what they're responsible for. You then move into the treasurer, and the treasurer is responsible for cash management of the firm, financing, oftentimes investor relations. Then there is the compliance function, and then there's risk management. So these are the four people that report primarily to a CFO, the controller, treasurer, compliance, risk management. Now, from a financial reporting perspective to the SEC, the CFO will sign his or her name as well as the controller, attesting that the financial practices of the firm are good, the numbers are correct and accurate. Let's dig a little deeper now into the controller's responsibility. They're into four basic categories. One is the bookkeeping or general accounting function of the organization. This is the group that maintains the general ledger, that does all the reconciliation, and everybody is, is, is electronic uh, technology based today. And there's subsystems. And these subsystems are accounts payable where they pay bills, keep track of who's owed money, inventory systems, accounts receivable who owes us money, and then fixed assets. So in the general accounting function, they keep the general ledger, they do reconciliations, they maintain the subsystems, make sure the subsystems come in appropriately so that they can run the general ledger. Then there is a reporting function that includes the external file, uh, uh, filing of forms, 10K, etc. And then there were internal reports as to what they're doing within the company. I've had responsibility for all of these at one time or another in my career. Then you move over to tax. And in the tax area, there's two things. Tax compliance, meaning you file tax returns and you deal with auditors. Next one is tax planning. This is a forward-looking function of how are we going to plan transactions to get the best tax benefit that we can. You're going to be reading the Wall Street Journal in the next six weeks, and you're going to see a lot of that um, is to tax transactions that are happening. And a lot of it having to do with earnings overseas and cash that's housed overseas, not brought back to the U.S. and taxed here. We then go into management accounting. I've had the responsibility of running a management accounting unit uh, where we did cost accounting, which is allocating costs to different business and support units analytics, what's going on in the company, um, planning functions, budgeting. Planning is longer term, I'd suggest to you. Budget is the next year. So these are the controller's functions. A lot of this is automated. Many of it's been outsourced, but it's still a critical portion. This is where we have a lot of accounting people work. As you move more into management accounting, you, you have a lot of folks who are more finance orientated than accounting, but it's all based on accounting. The next one we're going to look at is the treasurer. Uh, this is a fun one. Well, <laughs> it's a matter of what you define fun to be, uh, but it has three areas, cash management, financing, and investor relations. What they do in the cash management is they manage the day-to-day -day cash flow of the company. Okay, That's where's money coming in, where's it going out. Do we have enough? They manage the banking relationships. They do cash flow planning. They don't just wake up and say, oh, we got bills to pay today. How much money do we have? No, you have to plan that out. We're going to talk about a lot about that next week when we get into working capital and the cash flow cycle. We then get into the financing side. Should they borrow money? And if they do, this is the unit that will do the financing capital structure, which is the, we're going to get into this also. This is the balancing of do you have debt or do you have equity? How do you fund the long-term position of the corporation? We spend a lot of time in advanced finance going through. That also includes the investor relations, which is earnings releases, investor information, analyst meetings. So they're providing the information that the controller produces to investors, and it's about communication. So that's what the treasurer does. In risk management, 
which is the next area, they understand corporate risk. Risk takes on a lot of different forms, and we're going to talk about that, but very different forms. They develop plans to mitigate the risk. They execute plans to mitigate risk. So what they do is understand the risk. How do we mitigate? How do we control that risk? Then execute it. All that the CFO plays is one that has grown immensely in the past 10 years. Compliance and governance. And what this department does is it ensures compliance with all requirements, rules, regulations. They establish policy. They monitor compliance. And we've seen this in a lot of different things. It originally started with Enron and WorldCom, and I'll show you a brief video on that. Uh, but it was also, it's been in the news lately about reporting of cash transactions, uh, not reporting tax information on US citizens. The Swiss banks are dealing with that now. Um, many of them on money laundering. So this is where it started. Let's take a look at Enron and then WorldCom, and then we'll take a brief look at what Sarbanes-Oxley is. Then what I'd like you to do next, after you watch these two videos that follow this, what I'd like you to do is then move on to Application Project 1. And if you have any questions, please let me know. You guys are law enforcement? Yeah, we're an independent government agency who, along with the FBI and the Federal Reserve, regulate the stock market and corporate fraud. And the Federal Reserve is a prison? No, basically it's a help-for-profit bank that sets interest rates and loans money to other banks. Come on in, fella. You gotta be kidding me. You're Urshan's lawyer. We're turning over our investigation to you? Uh, let me assure you, there will be no conflict of interest between me and David Urshan. And if this were an actual investigation, I would immediately recuse myself. This is all the evidence we have, and I, I truly hope you take this seriously. Yes, very much so. From everything I've heard, I understand you guys are the best at these types of investigations. Uh, outside of Enron and AIG and Bernie Madoff, WorldCom. Meet Bernard J. Ebers, born on August 27, 1947, in Edmonton, Canada, to a family of traveling salesmen. Bernard was the second of five children. After high school, Ebers briefly attended the University of Alberta in Calvin College before enrolling at Mississippi College. During this time between schools, he worked as a milkman and bouncer. While attending Mississippi College, Ebers earned a basketball scholarship. An injury before his senior season prevented him from playing his final year. Bernard earned a bachelor's degree in physical education from Mississippi College in 1967 an honorary doctor of laws from Mississippi College in 1992 and also an honorary doctorate from Tungaloo College in 1998. Evers began his career operating motels in Mississippi. He joined with several other people in 1983 as investors in the newly formed Long Distance Discount Services Inc. and it became a public company after acquiring Advantage Companies Inc. Soon after it merged with another discount service provider Advanced Telecommunications Corporation, which resulted in the name WorldCom. Ebers was chief executive of the corporation. As the new CEO of WorldCom, Bernard focused much attention on the aggressive acquisitions of other telecommunication companies. While heading the company, Ebers led WorldCom through 17 mergers. In 1996, WorldCom acquired MFC Communications, Inc. for $12 billion which at the time was one of the largest corporate acquisitions in U.S. history. However, Bernard did not stop there, and in October of 1997, WorldCom announced a bid to acquire MCI Communications. WorldCom was not alone in its attempt to acquire one of the largest telecommunication companies in MCI. British Telecommunications Corporation offered $19 billion for MCI, but Bernard Evers was relentless in his aggressive acquisitions and countered BTC's offer with a $30 billion offer for MCI to which no company could match. The acquisition for MCI by WorldCom was finalized in September of 1998 at $35 billion, with Evers assuming $5 billion of the MCI debt. After the mergers, Evers received numerous accolades from the press for his role as CEO, while WorldCom quickly grew into one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. 
The WorldCom acquisition train did not stop there, however, and in 1999, Evers announced that MCI WorldCom was attempting to acquire rival company Sprint Communications for $129 billion. That fraud started in earnest after WorldCom's deal to acquire Sprint was turned away by federal regulators in the summer of 2000. With the Sprint deal being killed, it, it put us in a situation, who were you going to buy of any size? So now you had to turn into an operations company. And, and the question was posed, I think, in, in, on the street as well as internally is, is you know, how well will Bernie do as an operating CEO versus an acquisition and growth CEO? With his latest deal in shambles, Ebers faced an additional challenge in the summer of 2000, the most difficult operating environment of his career. The economy was in trouble, the telecom sector was in trouble, and WorldCom being part of that was in trouble. Certain businesses started to not be able to make their revenue targets. Um, so there was a lot more of um, customers that we were running across that had not paid their commitments to us. Of all those customers, the Internet companies were in the worst shape. In 2001, we, we processed over 100 bankruptcies out of that segment of all companies that just literally went out of business as customers of WorldCom, and in some cases left us with substantial billings. The answer, the biggest accounting fraud in the history of corporate America. They began to draw down on reserves, inflate their income when the reserves, as they must be, were ultimately exhausted. Then they undertook even more brazen efforts at restating expenses as capital expenditures, which had the effect of raising the income. WorldCom would make good on its earnings numbers for Wall Street by making those numbers up. If the actual numbers were used and not the Cook numbers, it would show that they missed those earning targets. In 11 out of the 13 quarters between 1998 and 2002, and in the last four of the last five quarters prior to the actual bankruptcy, they actually lost money. Senior managers at the company knew the true state of the business. What they couldn't figure out was how the numbers given investors were staying strong. The charges filed today are a result of an extensive investigation of WorldCom Incorporated. In August of 2002, the Justice Department indicted several top WorldCom executives. The charges followed the company's own admission that its profits for the previous three years were an illusion. Massive accounting fraud had made a business gone bad look good. The phony income would soon grow to more than $11 billion, the largest fraud ever committed by a U.S. corporation. We were astounded on the one hand. On the other hand, the light bulb went off. That's the answer that we didn't understand, and that was the reason that we couldn't understand. It was not only, oh my gosh, but wow, what a relief. What about anger? I, you know. I can understand relief and I can understand those emotions, but I have to believe that a part of you thinks about the thousands of employees who lost their jobs, the people you perhaps had to fire because you thought they weren't up to the task. Think of all the companies that went out of business that assumed that that was real. At WorldCom, few things were real. It was a company whose business model was built on a lie. This lie all along was orchestrated and controlled by Ebers. Prosecutors in the case successfully argued that Evers was running the show when masterminded this $11 billion fraud that toppled his company and troubled the entire telecommunications industry after. Bernard, with the assistance of WorldCom's former chief accounting officer, Scott Sullivan, chose to lie to their investors and regulators while artificially inflating their company's earnings and stock prices, while also failing to report their missed growth projections. With its rapid growth and numerous mergers, WorldCom accumulated billions in debt. With this looming debt, Evers and Sullivan turned to illegal accounting moves that misstated their revenues and actually inflated their earnings by hundreds of millions of dollars. This inevitably led to the collapse of WorldCom and the federal indictment that would soon follow. A final nail in the coffin for Bernard and the WorldCom dealt with sweetheart contracts and loans that were extended to Ebers by WorldCom's board of directors. The board extended Ebers $366 million in personal loans and loan guarantees, which he later defaulted on, and they totaled more than $400 million. This wrongdoing sparked an internal investigation two months later. In July of 2002, after accumulating $41 billion in debt, WorldCom filed for bankruptcy. 
after the internal investigation and cooperation from Scott Sullivan, a federal indictment was filed against Bernard Ebers in March of 2004. The charges included securities fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, and participation in filing false corporate records with the SEC. After a widely watched eight-week trial in early 2005, Evers was sentenced on July 13, 2005 to 25 years in federal prison for orchestrating the record $11 billion fraud. His sentence was one of the stiffest in corporate fraud cases ever at the time. Today, Bernard is serving out his sentence at Oakdale, Louisiana Federal Correction Institute after continued failed appeals of his conviction. He will remain locked up until 2027, when he would be 87 years old. It's beyond me how somebody could behave that way. I don't know how you get up and, if you're a man, and shave every morning and look at yourself in the mirror how you could live a life <clears throat> knowing the type of things that you're doing, uh, knowing that it's wrong. It is a United States federal law and acted on July 30, 2002. It is named after Senator Paul Sarbanes and Representative Michael Oxley. It was enacted after some really amazing corporate and accounting scandals, like the scandal in Enron and Worldcon. The legislation changed the life and the career of many corporate officers and auditors and companies listed in the United States. Although the act does not apply to privately held companies, many private, foreign and non-profit organizations volunteer to comply to prove that they meet international standards. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act was approved by the House by a vote of 423 to 3, and by the Senate by a vote of 99 to 0. President George Bush signed it into law. He said that this act is the most far-reaching reform of American business practices since the time of Franklin Roosevelt. Sarbanes-Oxley contains 11 titles. Each title consists of sections. The most important parts are... Title 1 Public Company Accounting Oversight Board There is established the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board to oversee the audit of public companies that are subject to the securities laws and related matters in order to protect the interests of investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports for companies the securities of which are sold to and held by and for public investors. Title 2. Auditor Independence Title 3. Corporate Responsibility The Principal Executive Officer and the Principal Financial Officer must certify in each annual or quarterly report that Based on the officer's knowledge, the report does not contain any untrue statement of a material fact or omit to state a material fact. Based on the officer's knowledge, the financial statements are correct in all material respects. Title 4. Enhanced Financial Disclosures Section 404. Management Assessment of Internal Controls An internal control report, which states the responsibility of management for establishing and maintaining an adequate internal control structure and procedures for financial reporting. The report contains an assessment of the effectiveness of the internal control structure and procedures of the issue for financial reporting. Each registered public accounting firm that prepares or issues the audit report for the issuer shall attest to and report on the assessment made by the management of the issuer. Title 5. Analyst Conflicts of Interest Title 8. Corporate and Criminal Fraud Accountability Section 806. Protection for Employees at Publicly Traded Companies Who Provide Evidence of Fraud no company, or any officer, employee, contractor, subcontractor, or agent of such company may discharge, demote, suspend, threaten, harass, or in any other manner discriminate against an employee in the terms and conditions of employment because of any lawful act done by the employee. To provide information, cause information to be provided, or otherwise assist in an investigation regarding any conduct which the employee reasonably believes constitutes a violation of any provision of federal law relating to fraud against shareholders. This is the whistleblower protection. To read more, visit the reading room of our association.
The Sarbanes Oxley Compliance Professionals Association is the large. Those three videos give you a sense of what drove some of the rules and regulations that are now in place. Banks and other institutions have paid billions and billions of dollars in fines. And they have spent the past couple of years beefing up their compliance staff. Uh, and here's a definition of what the chief compliance officer. Notice it's a CCO. Just like we have a CEO, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, officer COO, chief financial officer, CFO, and now we're seeing a lot more chief compliance officer. And they typically report to the chief executive officer. And the definition that we have here is they're primarily responsible for overseeing and managing regulatory compliance issues within an organization. This includes preventing a problem from happening, and that involves making sure there's a process and procedures in place, monitoring, and when they find something that doesn't work, addressing it and fixing it, as well as responding to regulators and others what is going on. Now, just to give you a sense of this, they're not auditors, okay? The numbers have quadrupled in the past few years and continue to grow at a rapid, rapid pace. Currently, we have over 250,000 people working in compliance, okay? The mean annual wage of all levels is $69,000. That's not too bad. The ranges, though, go from forty-five dollars to $250,000. So a lot of compliance, the skills that are needed are analytical skills, financial skills, the be able to solve problems, the be able to organize data. Now, this is just one area that needs people with finance background. You use finance in everything you do. Finance provides managers tools to understand their business, help them make decisions, and help them evaluate progress towards goals. Every manager and organization needed an understanding of this topic because that's how companies run is based on financial data, not just accounting. Uh, accounting is a component of it, but how you take accounting information and make it useful. Um, some of these opportunities lie in personal and commercial banking. Lending analysis and credit approval are more detailed. Investment and wealth management, that's banks, mutual funds, exchange traded funds, and other institutional investors. Research and portfolio management, trading, venture capital. Um, there's a lot of different roles within this that are built on the fundamental skills that we're going to learn about this summer. Other opportunities in finance, economic development, both from a private perspective and a public perspective. And then there's a virtual business. Finance is everywhere, okay? But some of them are basic tools. And when you get that, much of this is tools that you will use no matter whether you're accounting, finance, business, uh, international relations, communications, chemistry, anything to do with business is part of that. So that's our first video. I suggest you move on to the next one. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.